So this is a, a picture of Terry Horton. And in the mid-90s, Terry became a bit of a, a controversial figure in the art world. And not so much because of her skill or her creativity or anything she made, but it was because of what she possessed and what she owned. And what she owned was this painting that's behind her. She came across it in the, the mid-90s. She worked the majority of her career as a truck driver. And when she retired from truck driving, she fell in love with uh, you know, thrift shopping and consignment shopping. And one day, she walked into a Cal California thrift store, and she saw this painting displayed. Uh, and she was actually out looking for a birthday gift for a close friend, and she saw this and thought this would be a fun gift and a bit of a joke gift to give to her friend. And she went up to the clerk at the store, and she asked how much it was, and the guy was like, $8. And she's like, well, I love my friend, but not that much. I'll give you $5 for the painting. And the clerk said, you got a deal, sold. Now, this painting is huge. You can see in the next picture just how big it is when she is standing next to it, and she gave this painting to her friend, and her friend absolutely hated it. Now, Terry also hated it. She thought it was ugly, and she really just bought it as a joke, but it was so big, like her friend couldn't fit it in her house. She didn't have a room for it. She didn't have any place for it, so she ended up giving it back to Terry, and Terry didn't want it, and so she tried to get rid of it at a yard sale somewhere in her neighborhood, and she's just there with this painting, working this yard sale, and an art teacher walked by and said to her, hey, you know, that might be a Jackson Pollock. And her response to that was, who the heck is Jackson Pollock? Now, I don't know if anybody here knows who Jackson Pollock is, but he's a, a mid-20th century American painter and was quite famous, lived a short life, died when he was in his mid-40s, but his his Famous, his work was quite famous, quite well-known, and the style with which he painted was he would put a canvas out on a floor, and he would take a paint can, and he would take a brush, and he would drip and splatter and throw paint on the canvas and step back and look at it and see this kind of chaotic mess that he created. And his paintings sold for millions and millions of dollars. Uh, his most expensive painting, which is this next picture, sold for $140 million. And so when Terry learned who Jackson Pollock was, she had a very different view and perception of this ugly painting that she bought for $5 as a joke for her friend. Now, the one challenge with her painting was there wasn't any clear way to figure out whether or not it was an original. Because of the style of Jackson Pollock's work, many people created knockoff Jackson Pollock's. I mean, any monkey with a paintbrush could probably do it, right? And so people were all the time trying to create these knockoffs. And so the art world was oftentimes skeptical of paintings that looked like the one that Terry had. And so because she didn't have any proof of what it was, she went to great lengths to try and authenticate the painting. She had it um, looked at by, by different art experts who studied his style of work and actually were experts in his work. Uh, she even hired a forensic art expert to try and figure out, is there any DNA of Jackson Pollock on this canvas. Turns out they found a fingerprint that they claimed to be Jackson Pollock's fingerprint. She went to great lengths to authenticate this painting, but nobody in the art world really believed that it was a true Jackson Pollock because what she didn't have was something they call in the art world a provenance. It's a certificate basically of authentication. And so she spent the last 15 years of her life trying to prove that it's authentic and could never do it and eventually died without ever having let go of this painting, without ever having sold it and having it somewhere buried in her garage or in an attic. And it raises the question, well, how do you know? Like, how do you know if something is authentic? How do you know? If it's real, how do you know if it's a painting by Jackson Pollock? How do you know that it is real? Terry became the subject of a documentary titled, Who the Heck is Jackson Pollock? 
that tells the story of her trying to authenticate the authenticity of this painting and never could do it. How do you know if something is authentic? Now, that same question can be used of people as well. How do you know someone is authentic? Because anybody, especially these days, can claim to be anything they want. They can claim all sorts of things about themselves, but what they claim about themselves, the question is whether or not that's actually true. When I was in high school, I really wanted to be a skateboarder. Uh, I used to snowboard, and I figured skateboarding can't be that much more challenging, right? You're kind of doing the same thing. So I went out and I bought a skateboard. I bought some like cool skateboarder clothes and I tried really hard, maybe not really hard, but I tried to be a skateboarder. And if you would have asked me, do you skate? I'd be like, yeah, I skate. That's right. I'm a skateboarder. I wear the clothes. I got the board. But like when you went to the skate park and you watched other guys skate Like, they were true skateboarders. I tried skating for like a month, and then I realized somewhere along the way, if I'm going to get good at this, I have to be okay with breaking some bone in my body, and I wasn't up for that, so I quit skating. We can can claim anything about ourselves. It's not just how do you know something is authentic, but how do you know someone is authentic? And this question even is significant in our faith although it's altered just a little bit. It's not just, how do you know someone is authentic, but how do you know a disciple of Jesus Christ is authentic? How do you know a disciple is authentic? Many people wrestle with this question. Many people wrestle with this question about themselves. Like, like how do I know? Like, it, how do I know I, I'm really a part of God's family? Like, how do I know that I'm, I'm really going to be with Jesus when I die? How do I know that what I believe is true and that I'm actually committed to what I say I believe? Many people wrestle with this question about themselves. Many people also wrestle with this question about other people. As they observe other people and observe the way they live and they see someone claiming to be a Christian, but then they see them live inconsistent with what they claim to believe, it's like, well, Is that really true of them? Lots of people also know individuals in their life who have had real encounters with God, seemingly had a true conversion experience, have claimed, yes, I have all my faith and confidence in Jesus, but then over time, it seems as though they drift. It seems as though they move away from the faith, and it leaves people wondering, was that ever true? real. Was that ever authentic? So how do you know? How do you know if a disciple of Jesus is authentic? Well, in John 13, our passage today, Jesus names the hallmark characteristic of what makes a true disciple. Now, we've been saying over the last few weeks that John 13 marks a new section in John's gospel. It's the moment where Jesus kind of has his sights set on the cross. It's the final evening before Jesus will ultimately march to Golgotha to be executed by the hands of the Romans on a cross. And the last night that he spends, he spends with his disciples around a dinner table, around a meal. And his intention with this meal is to teach his disciples a few final things before he is to die. And what he does initially at the beginning of the evening is he teaches them something, not so much with words, but with actions, because as the meal is in process, he gets up from his seat and he washes all of the disciples' feet. And then after he does that, he starts to talk about there's someone among them who is going to betray Jesus, and then Jesus actually calls out who it is. It's Judas. And then he sends Judas out into the night to go execute the plan that he has concocted to ultimately do away with Jesus. And then this is what we read, the start of verse 31. When he, he being Judas, was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. Anybody know what those two verses are about? Like it's all over. Five times in two verses, the word glory, glorify, glorified is used. The theme of glory 
is front and center in this section of John's gospel. Five times in two verses, he uses that word. And this isn't just a significant theme in this section. The theme of glory is a wildly significant theme in all of John, especially when you notice how much John uses the word glory in comparison to all the other gospel accounts. If you take the words glory, glorify, and glorified, and you compare them with how much Matthew, Mark, and Luke use them, Matthew will use those words four times, Mark three times, Luke bumps it up to nine, but then John uses those terms 33 times. He's trying to say something significant about who Jesus is through this term. And John introduces this theme right from the beginning. In chapter 1, verse 14, he says, The Word became flesh, the Word being Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, glory is an interesting term, and it gets used in a variety of ways. Oftentimes, it's used in religious context. Sometimes, it's used in non-religious context. But either way, there are two primary ways that the term glory gets used. Oftentimes, it's used as something that is emanated from some sort of object, meaning glory is displayed. And when glory is on display, it's usually uh, talked about in terms of beauty and splendor. And we might think of a sunset or a sunrise. This is a picture that somebody uh, recently sent to me of a sunset on their lake home. And if you were on that dock looking at that lake, you'd be like, ah, like that is a glorious sunset. Because when glory is displayed, it's perceived as beautiful. It has splendor, majesty. But glory is also something that can be received. And when it is received, it usually comes in the form of honor and esteem, often in response to some sort of status that somebody has or an achievement that they have achieved. Now, at some level, because we're all kind of self-obsessed, glory is something that we're all seeking, whether we realize it or not. Like, we all are after glory in some way. Uh, this is a picture of Joe DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio was one of the greatest baseball players to ever play the game. He played baseball for the Yankees, um, and he had two stints with them. He played in 1936 to 1942, and then he played again in 1946, or excuse me, he played in 1936 to 42, and then 46 to 51. And during those two stints in playing for the Yankees, he actually enlisted in the Air Force during World War II, and he was stationed in a few different bases, and he served as like a physical education instructor in the Air Force. Uh, and when the war ended in 1954, Joe went back to New York, and before he rejoined the team, he went to a baseball game just to be a fan on a particular afternoon. And he wanted to bring his son. His son's name was Joe DiMaggio Jr. So Joe DiMaggio and Joe DiMaggio Jr. go to this baseball game, and he's trying to go incognito so people don't know that it's him, and he can just go enjoy a baseball game with his son. Somewhere along the way, fans started to notice that Joe DiMaggio was in the crowd, and they started chanting, Joe, Joe, Joe DiMaggio, Joe, Joe, and they're just like going bonkers. And little Joe DiMaggio Jr., as it, he hears all of these cheers for his dad, looks up to his dad and he says, See, Dad, I told you, I'm kind of a big deal around here. <laughs> thinking it was for him. Like, just naturally thinking, oh, this is for me. Because we naturally are people who are seeking glory. We're naturally drawn to it in part because we're image bearers of God. And it's part of who God is. But in our twisted, self-obsessed way, we often want it from a worldly vantage point. Glory is something that we're all drawn to, and it's something we all want. But notice both in chapter 1, verse 14, whose glory is on display. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have seen His glory. In chapter 13, verse 31 and 32, who is the one both emanating glory and receiving glory? It's the Father and the Son. The Son is glorified, and the Father receives glory through the Son. There's this continual reciprocal giving and receiving of glory from Father to Son with the Holy Spirit mixed in there. 
And the world views glory very differently than the Bible talks about glory. And we have to do a little work to understand what is worldly glory in comparison to biblical glory. And I think uh, one simple way that we can articulate this, um, I didn't bring this out earlier because I didn't know how distracting it might be. Um, If the world perceives glory, it perceives it as a disco ball, right? It's shiny, it's sparkly, it's focused on outward appearances, it's fun, it hangs up high, and it's one of those things that enhances a good time. Like if the world is going to perceive glory in some way, it's going to perceive it as a disco ball. But if we're going to understand a biblical view of glory, we have to go back to the Old Testament. Because even in John 13, the word glory is rooted in the idea of glory as it's uh, portrayed in the Old Testament. The first time that the word glory is used in the Old Testament is Exodus 14. The, The people of God have just come out of Egypt. They've just been released. They're about to cross through the Red Sea. God's just about to part it. And he says, I'm going to receive glory when Pharaoh's army is defeated. But the term that's used for glory in the Old Testament is the Old Testament word kavod. Take that with me, kavod. It doesn't mean splendor and beauty and awe and wonder. Kavod means heavy. It means weighty. So when God says, I am going to receive glory, I'm going to receive kavod, he says, I'm going to receive weightiness. I'm going to gain weight, essentially, is what God is saying. And so that means if the world definition of glory is like a disco ball, the biblical definition of glory is like a medicine ball. It's something that has weight to it. It's something that has substance to it. Like you could drop this ball and it would break. All these little shiny mirror pieces would go scattering and all over the floor. But if you were to drop this ball, it might put a dent in the floor. The biblical idea of glory is weightiness. Now, that's not at the expense, though, of God's beauty and majesty. Because in this biblical idea of glory, those two things come together. We see this in Psalm 19. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Paul Paul will say something similar in Romans 1. He says, if you go out into the world, God is constantly revealing himself through the beauty of creation. That sunset picture from earlier, that just emanates God's goodness, God's glory, God's creativity, God's splendor, but God also carries this weight It carries this substance. One Bible dictionary talks about the idea of glory in this way. It says, The biblical idea of glory captures God's infinite and intrinsic worth. To say it another way, it's his substance. It's his essence. But this raises the question, if that's what God's glory is, is its weightiness, its substance, it's his essence. It raises the question, like, what is that? Like, what specifically is the substance or essence of God's glory? Jesus goes on to say this in verse 33. He says, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just, I t- just as I told the Jews, so I will tell you now where I am going you cannot come. Jesus is making it very clear. I've been, you for, been with you for three years, but now it's time for me to leave. And so this is where, if Jesus' final teachings come in chapter 13 through 17 before he goes to the cross, this is the beginning. Most commentators say it's not until after Judas leaves the dinner that Jesus really starts to teach his final words. And final words are significant. Final words are weighty. And Jesus begins his final words saying this, verse 34, A new command I give to you. 
essentially standing in the place of Moses, standing in the tradition of Moses as the original lawgiver for the people of God, a new command, I give to you, love one another. What John is trying to say, what John is trying to demonstrate is that the substance or the weight of God's glory is his love. His love for you, his love for all of creation, his love for the people who are turning his back on him, his love. John, the writer of this gospel, captures this same idea in one of his letters. In 1 John verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 16, he says in the most simple, plain terms as he can, God is love. That's who God is. God is love, the substance of of God's glory, the essence of God's glory, the weight of God's glory is his love. Now, this really isn't anything new. We would say from the beginning of time, that's who God is. God doesn't change. But what Jesus is doing here is he's marking a new chapter in the story of God's people. He's going to make a new covenant in his blood, as we say, through his death on the cross. He's kind of creating this stake in the ground moment like this is the most important thing that you need to know. And the Father and Son are just giving this glory, giving this love back and forth in verse 31 and verse 32. But we, as followers of Jesus, have to do a little bit of work in understanding, again, this biblical idea of love because our culture has a very different view of love. Our culture will view love oftentimes as convenience. Like, I'll love when it's convenient for me. Uh, There's this term out there. I don't know if anybody's heard it. It's called a situationship. Anybody heard that term? If you're a younger person, maybe Gen Z, you you might know of it. You might have heard of it. Um, it, It's a way to describe relationships with connection, but no commitment. Like, you have a connection with a person, but you're not really committed to them. You're not even really all that exclusive in your relationship with them. There's no real definition to what you are. You're hesitant to use terms like boyfriend, girlfriend, or even partner. And you're in a relationship with this individual because the circumstances surrounding it, the situation, makes it convenient. It just makes it like, ah, we fall into this thing. And it makes it really easy. So that means when your situation changes, if you're living in Milwaukee and you get a new job in, say, Nashville, it's like this relationship's just going to change. Like, I'm really not going to base my decision to take this job on this relationship. I'm not even expecting you to follow with me. We're just in this situation. And so if my situation changes, whoa, watch out, the relationship also changes. Now, our culture not only views love as convenience, we also view it as romance, right? We have this expectation that there's passion, there's excitement, there's newness, freshness, there's a sense of mystery to it. It comes with these grand gestures where we make big declarations of love. There's this old diamond commercial, I think for like, you know, Tiffany Diamonds or whatever, the the jewelry store, where it's this couple seemingly in Europe in this kind of like city courtyard. There's people walking around, and it has just rain, and so there's a little kind of like rain puddles on the ground, and this guy says, hey, I got to do something for a second. And he steps away from this woman that he's with, and he just starts screaming, I love this woman. I love this woman. I love this woman. And she gets a little embarrassed and pulls him close and like, ah, I kind of stopped that. And then he pulls out of his pocket this diamond ring, and he says, I love this woman, right? Like we expect love to be romantic with these grand gestures that accompany with passion and feeling, and it creates this expectation of consistent exhilaration, right? But when you're in the throes of raising three kids, and you can barely keep your eyes open past eight o'clock at night when they go to bed, it feels like romance is just gone, and there's no way that we can resurrect it, so we go looking for romance somewhere else. So our culture views love as convenience, romance, and sometimes as tolerance. We just tolerate people, meaning we let people do what they want. We we don't interject ourselves into their life choices. You just do what you want. You do you, I'll do me. We'll like, you know, 
And love is just letting people live their own lives without stepping in in any other way. But Jesus says, this new command I give to you, love one another. He goes on to say in verse 34, as I have loved you. So you must love one another. What Jesus has just done in this moment is he has just washed the disciples' feet. He has gotten low, he has gotten close, he has gotten messy with them. He has just washed their feet and he says, I have set for you an example for what you should do for others. Now that doesn't mean we should all go around washing each other's feet. That's not what Jesus is saying. But he's saying the love that we exude in the world isn't romantic, isn't tolerant, and isn't convenient, but it's sacrificial. It's sacrificial. Love isn't, hey, just what I want to, love is inconvenient. Love is commitment even when the passion wanes. Love is commitment even when the feelings aren't always reciprocal. Love is self stepping into someone else's self-destructive patterns because you see the end result of that and you want to save them and spare them from the foolishness on which they're running. Love is cleaning up other people's messes even when they don't realize you're doing it. Love is being patient with your kids when you're trying to get them to walk into the school building. And they've done this a hundred times, but yet on this day they have this unfounded anxiety and they're resisting going into school and you're already late for a meeting. So instead of yelling at them and just throwing them in the school, like you sit with them, you're patient with them. You learn what's going on, and then you gently walk them in, and you show up 15 minutes late to wherever you're going to be. Love is listening to your parents tell the same story about where they bought this painting in Italy on this vacation 30 years ago, and you've heard it a hundred times, and they're telling it to you like it's the first time, and you're like, ah, love is getting excited when they tell you that story yet again. Love is celebrating your coworkers' success and being able to be happy for them, even though they got the job that you were hoping for. Love is sacrifice. It's putting other people first. It's thinking about others before yourself. And then Jesus goes on to say this in verse 35. He says, by this, by this kind of love, by this sacrificial act, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, everyone will know you're my disciple because you attend church on a regular basis. He doesn't say, everyone will know you're my disciple by how many scripture verses you can repeat from memory. He doesn't say, everyone will know you're my disciple because you wear a, a crummy Christian t-shirt and put a Christian bumper sticker on the back of your car. He doesn't say, everyone will know you're my disciple because of the way you vote. He doesn't say, everyone will know that you're my disciple because you go to the Ark Encounter down in Lexington, Kentucky for your vacation. Right? That's not what marks you as a disciple. It is your sacrificial love that mirrors and models the sacrificial love that Jesus has for the world. Jesus is saying the authenticity of your discipleship is your love. Full stop. That's what marks you out as a true follower of Jesus. And notice that Jesus is talking to the 11 in that room. He's not talking about going out and loving the world. He's saying, you right here. Now, loving your family, sometimes the hardest people to love. It's true with your spiritual family. It's true with your church family. You can walk in here every given Sunday, and you see somebody walking across the lobby. You're like, I'm going to that corner of the lobby, so I don't have to talk to that person. Loving the people that, who are in our community, who we don't get to choose that we're in community with, sometimes those are the hardest people to love. But when the world sees us living in radical commitment to one another, it turns heads. That's what's happening in Acts chapter 2. We remember Acts chapter 2, 
church is born, Jesus is gone, the Holy Spirit comes, and we have this beautiful description of the way the early church is living in constant community, connection, caring for one another, worshiping together, sharing meals together, and it says that daily people were added to their number because they saw this radical commitment of love and they were drawn to it. And so my question for us this morning is what is the measure of your discipleship based on the life of love that you live? How would other people notice your discipleship? Do they notice your discipleship? Is there anything different or distinct about you based on the way you live and love and serve your family, those in your church community, your neighbor who lives right next door. But before we can ever open our mouth to declare what it is we believe, Jesus is challenging us to embody his sacrificial love for the world. The authenticity of your discipleship is love. Now, here's what I want to do to close us um, today. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is, we call it the wedding passage, right? It's the passage that's most often read at weddings. And truthfully, when we listen to that passage read at weddings, we probably zone out because we hear it and we expect it and it's just wrote. But when you think of the picture of love that Paul sets out in this passage, the question is, like, where is God inviting me to grow in my discipleship by embodying one of these traits. And so here's what I want to invite you to do. I'll have it on the screen in just a minute. But I just want to invite you into like a posture of receiving and hearing for the next moment as I read this verse. I'm going to read it slowly. And I want you to pay attention. Like, is there an attribute of love that Paul lists in this passage that just for some reason jumps off the page to me as God might be saying this to me this morning? Meaning he might be saying like, hey, this is what I want you to pay attention to. This is what I want you to notice in your life. Maybe this is an area where you can start to practice compassionate curiosity about your own life. Like, why does this not, this one characteristic, why is this not evident in my life? And to hold that before the Lord, not only in this moment, but as you go into this week. And so if you're somebody who takes notes, maybe you write that word down. If you have your Bible with you, maybe you circle it or underline it. But what is the thing that God wants you to know about where and how you can grow in your own love in the week ahead? This is 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4. Love is patient. Where do you grow impatient in your life? Love is kind. It does not envy. Love does not boast. Where are you wanting people to know about your accomplishments and your subtly putting out humble brags to try and let people know what you've done? Love is not proud. It's not arrogant. Love does not dishonor others. Love is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Where does anger rule your life? Love keeps no records of wrong. It doesn't hold grudges. It doesn't keep score. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. So Lord, this morning I would pray that we would comprehend the challenge of love. Lord, I pray that we would be able to see it evidently displayed in our life. Lord, and when we forget what this love looks like, I pray that we would look back to you. We would look back to your sacrificial death on the cross. We would look at the way you bent down and washed the disciples' feet. That we would look to the way that you lowered yourself, that you became human even uh, to the point of death. And we would understand, we would count the cost that this is the love that you are calling us to exude in this world. And so, Lord, I pray 
that you would help us be the type of people who can receive your love and recognize really the only reason that we can love in this way is because we have, been, we have first been loved by you. We love you, Lord. And ask that you would help us to be people who share that love to this church, to our family, to our friends, and to the world around us. Pray this in your name. Amen.